Hi! Who am I? Who are you? And who's that doctor over there? It's November 2023. It's the 60th anniversary month of Doctor Who. I've been waiting for this month for about 60 years now. I'm really looking forward to Doctor Who. However, I don't really appreciate the show that much. Not as much as I'd like. So, I thought we'd spend the next hour discussing why Doctor Who is the greatest show in the galaxy. Doctor Who is not just a typical show. Doctor Who is a one-of-a-kind show. There is nothing like Doctor Who, and there never, ever will be. The show started in 1963. And ever since, the show's been on TV for seven different decades. And unlike shows from the 60s, like, for example, Coronation Street, that has like, the same basic idea of people living on a street in Manchester, Doctor Who has managed to change and evolve into something entirely different even though the plot is basically the same. That is because our main character can regenerate, turn himself into someone new. This has allowed the show to remain fresh and just change with the times. And that is how the show hasn't been cancelled yet, because no one playing the Doctor has died. So, why don't we look through these last 60 years together, and we can see how it's changed and evolved, and we can see, truly, why the show is the greatest in the galaxy. The beginning of time, the original series, starts here. In 1963, the first episode of Doctor Who heard, William Hartnell, William Russell, Jacqueline Hill and Carol Ann Ford are the main cast in the first season of Doctor Who. The first episode, An Unearthly Child, is fun. It set the groundworks for the show, and it also heard the day after JFK's death. Yeah. It meant the show wasn't watched that much on the first day, and it resulted in a rerun being made, and ended up giving the show a big boost in ratings. However, only the first episode of this serial are good. Like, the next three are... meh. Like, I suppose episode two's enjoyable, but the rest are just... boring. The next serial, The Daleks, is what kept Doctor Who going to this day. It is the first Doctor Who serial you can watch on iPlayer due to a certain incident that I won't be talking about. Anyway, so Serial 2. Well, it's fun, it's cool to see the Daleks for the first time. But my God, it drags on for ages. But I will say, if I just want to sit down and watch some good Doctor Who for a while, this one would be a good one to watch. The third Serial, and also what was meant to be the final Serial of Doctor Who ever, The Edge of Destruction, is cool. It shows early evidence of the TARDIS being alive and telepathic, but I haven't seen it in a while and I think there should be more stories set inside the TARDIS. It really tries to build on the TARDIS and we should see more of that, seeing as it is the main setting for the entire show. Okay, so I'm not going to sit here and talk about every episode of Doctor Who. As much as I want to, if I did do that, we'd be here by the 70th anniversary. So I just plan to go over the important ones or the ones that I just particularly like from this point on. Or both. So let's skip into the second season, The Dalek Invasion of Earth. It's the second ever Dalek story, and it features the first departure of a companion. Susan leaves the Doctor as he decides that she has a future with David, a man they met during the invasion. I think it's a stupid idea from the old dog, but who am I to judge? I'm not a grandparent. Anymore. Anyway, so then the travellers meet Vicky to just replace Susan, and then they just go off on more adventures, and then they meet the Daleks again in the chase. It's fun. Ian and Brabo leave to go to London 1965. And after spending two years trying to bet to their own time, William Hartnell is the only remaining cast member from the first episode. Soon enough, the Doctor meets Stephen and they travel for a while. Stephen's my favourite companion of the first Doctor, and I'm not sure why, but I'm honest. I've not seen a lot of his appearances. Then again, a lot of people haven't seen his appearances these days. 
That's because 60s episodes of Doctor Who just have a lot of missing episodes. The BBC wiped a lot for a lot of the tapes to be reused in the future to save money. That means we're currently missing the footage for nearly 100 episodes of Doctor Who. Luckily, they have audio recordings and can live on through recons and animations. Anyway, skipping forward for a few companions, and a long 12-part adventure with the Daleks that I've not seen but I will soon get around to, the Doctor faces the Cybermen for the first time with his relatively new companions, Ben and Polly. However, this ends up to be fatal, and the first Doctor dies in his TARDIS, turning into the second Doctor, played by Patrick Troughton. More on him later. The Cybermen are personally my second favourite enemy of Doctor Who. Only behind the Daleks, of course. I love the idea of them being, like, basically human who needed technology to prolong their lives. The problem with that is, though, I don't think a lot of writers get them right. Some write them purely as, like, an empire who wants to invade a planet for some reason. But the correct way, in my opinion, is that they're a small, smallish race struggling to survive so that they can convert people to prolong the survival of their race. Or perhaps they convert people due to a belief that people would be better off being converted. And people do write the Cyberman like that, to be fair. But I just want that to be more explored in the future. And I really think, like, a Cyberman body horror is something that should really be touched on in the future if the show does end up going down a darker path. Anyway, so the 10th planet is a good introduction for the Cybermen and regeneration. Regeneration is a really cool concept as it just allows the show to just stay forever fresh and new. And I'm glad it's grown and evolved over time, from a feature of the TARDIS to a thing all Time Lords can do at death. So, the first Doctor is gone and fans were left on a cliffhanger of regeneration for the very first time. The first Doctor's weird to me. I mean, yeah, he's the Doctor, alright, but a lot of what we call the Doctor now is just missing. I mean, obviously, yeah, he is the first incarnation of the character, and that's not an issue. But I do feel strange looking at him and knowing that he is the Doctor and there's so much more to come for him. I mean, the early days were he was a very different Doctor. For example, when he was about to bash a caveman's skull in with a rock, or when he just smokes a pipe. That said, I adore Hartnell, and I respect the love he had for the show, and it's a shame I'll never get to meet him. I do think the first Doctor... Tazera did a really great job on laying the groundwork for the rest of the show. The Doctor, as I said, still has a lot more to come, and for him to grow and change. But for the time, and for the context, I really do think this era is amazing, and a great start for any show, especially any show that's going to become the greatest in the galaxy. But now we're on to the second Doctor's era, starting with the power of the Daleks. Yes, that's right. They're back and ready to face the new Doctor in his first ever adventure. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of this serial, and it does upset me to say that, because I enjoy the first scenes with two and the cliffhanger of the first episode, even if the impact is kind of lost when the story is called The Power of the Daleks. But still. Anyway, I just find it, like, really boring, and I can't really pin why, but I just can't engage with it at all. And that is a shame, really. I mean, the post-regeneration episode of the second Doctor is important, and I'm not knocking it at all, and I still think it's good and cool, but I am not a fan of this story. The sad thing about season four is that most of it is missing, including the Highlanders, and I've never seen this, or heard it, or anything, but I have watched stories with Jamie in. Jamie is my favourite second Doctor companion. The chemistry is always fun, and they always just have funny lines together. Anyway, anyway, so Ben and Polly leave the Doctor, Jamie and the Doctor meet Victoria. And then she leaves, and then they meet Zoe. All while meeting the Cybermen like 50 times a day. Yes, the Cybermen are like everywhere in this era. I remember someone saying, why treat this like a shock when they're here like once a week or something like that? And it's like stuck in my mind since. Like, I don't mind the Cybermen, but I just think they were a bit much in this era. Anyway, so I enjoy the next two seasons of what I've seen, of course. And to be fair... I feel like they've perfected the formula of Doctor Who by now. And they give some of the best stories ever made for the show. But before you know it, time was up. And in 1969, Troughton left the show in the ten-part story, The War Games. The War Games is a wild ride. I've seen it a few times, and I do enjoy it quite a lot. It feels more like a regeneration story than the tenth planet ever did, to be fair. And the tenth part is even cooler as it introduces the Time Lords to the show. 
and it has them as, like, their most intimidating. They're so powerful in this story, they just wipe the bad guys from existence, and then they separate Jamie and Zoe from the Doctor, and they will never see each other again, as their minds are just wiped, and they will never remember the Doctor. As for the Doctor, he's practically executed and exiled on Earth, and the final shot for the second Doctor, and the 60s of the whole, was him being spun around into a dark void of uncertainty. So that was the 60s of Doctor Who. What a start! The show has cemented itself in British culture by now, and I can already see a plot of what the show would become in these stories now. So, shall we move on to the 70s? The 1970s. Here we go. We're in colour now, and the Doctor is stranded on Earth. That's right, no more travelling through time and space for the Doctor. It's now just sitting on Earth in the 70s, waiting for the exile to be lifted. I've never gelled with the third Doctor's era. I don't like it that much. I think it has amazing bits, like Pertwee as the Doctor or Delgado as the Master, but I, I just don't like it. Straight away, the Brigadier is my favourite third Doctor companion. They just work amazingly together, but... I don't know, man, I just... It bores me, like, you know? Like, I find the first and last serials of season 7 really good. The rest just kind of bore me. Season 8 introduces the Master, and he's cool that it's like he's in every serial. But again, they play his involvement in the story as a surprise, even though he's always there. Season nine's forgettable, in my opinion, and I can't remember anything about it. I'm sure if I gave it a rewatch, I'd enjoy it, but... Oh... I don't even know what the first episode's called. Now, season 10, this is something I really like. The first Doctor meets his past selves for the first time in The Three Doctors and faces the Time Lord Omega to save the universe with his two selves. And then he gets his freedom back and now he can just go and leave Earth. Finally! So along with Joe Grant, he tries to take it to Metabilis 3 for a few serials before ending back on Earth again. I've always liked how this season had this little overarching plot of trying to get there before actually getting there for all of, like, three minutes. Carnival of Monsters is a fun Doctor Who story. It just screams Doctor Who to me. It makes no sense, but it's really fun to watch. Sadly, though, this season does feature the last appearance of Roger Delgado as the Master. Sadly, he would die in a car accident while filming something overseas. This would then set in motion Pertwee's departure from the show in the next season. Speaking of the Master, the last appearance of Delgado in the role is... Eh, I don't know. It has been a while since I've last watched it, and it would be fun if I watched it again, but I wouldn't, like, rush to it, you know? I do like the cliffhanger in one of the episodes of the Master teaming up with the Daleks, and then the serial leading into the next serial, Planet of the Daleks. Although, it just reminds me... It just reminds me of that one episode from season one where the Doctor meets the Daleks for the first time on their home planet with help from the Falls and defeats them. At the end of the season, we have the Green Death, Joe Grant's final season as the Doctor's companion. It's alright. The political message is very clear and still kind of relevant to this day. I think the final shot of the Doctor driving away and Bessie in the dark and alone is really well done and even quite sad in its own way. Season 11 is the final season to feature Pertwee as the Doctor, and the first to feature Elizabeth Sladen as Sarah Jane Smith. The season's like season 10. I enjoy it more than the other Pertwee seasons. But I'm going to be quick with this one because Tom Baker is just around the corner. The Time Warrior is a cool introduction to the Sontarans and welcomes Sarah Jane into the show. It's fun and it's well done. Invasion of the Dinosaurs slept on in my opinion. Yes, some of the effects are corny for the time, but... It's Doctor Who, I don't expect the best from this show sometimes. Can jog on a bit, would watch again. Death of the Daleks is... Eh, I mean, it's a Dalek episode. So it's fun. But it's not the best the Daleks can be. And it features this cliffhanger. The Monster of Peladon. I've not seen the original, but I enjoyed this one. The Ice Warriors really should have more of a presence on the show, in my opinion. Planet of the Spiders is fun Doctor Who, with a sense of doom coming for the Doctor. It was actually filmed at the same time as the next season's opener, and the third Doctor's death is bittersweet, 
as he accepts the Earth to be his home at last. So the third Doctor's error. A bit of it is just a miss for me, really, but I do love the third Doctor, like I would any other Doctor. I mean, though, this error didn't induce unit, but it did flesh it out and has allowed it to remain on the show to this day. The companions Liz, Joe and Sarah are all good in their right, but I just wish we'd gotten more with Liz and that she was given an actual exit. Like, what was up with that? To me, this error is where the universe started to feel more lived in. For example, unit being a consistent thing, and the mentions of planets or adventures we see the Doctor go on like Metabilis 3. The show starts to feel even more like it does today. Anyway, time to go forward, and it's now the fourth Doctor's era. Season 12's arrived. Tom Baker arrived. And it is not instantly a hit with fans, some saying he's too silly and calling to bring back the third Doctor. But soon, all of this changes and Tom Baker is a household name. Everyone knows the fourth Doctor. He is the Doctor most people will think of when you say Doctor Who. And his first serial is mid. It's fun, and I'll watch it again at some point. And we do meet the newest companion, Harry, who is certainly... something. I enjoy him, but some people don't. He was originally meant to take the place of the heroic young man as they wanted to cast the Doctor as an older man for the role. And Harry's actor was fired by the first serial of the season. It is just Doctor Who, though. Like, the season's great. Arc in space is great. The Centauran experiment's okay, I guess. I mean, it's only two parts long, so it's over before it really begins. I do remember hearing Elizabeth Sladen almost died while filming, and Tom Breaker broke his arm, so I'm lucky there was only two parts. God knows what could have happened if there was four. The part one cliffhanger literally just reveals that the Santarans are back in the serial called The Santaran Experiment. Genesis of the Daleks is amazing. It is a true return to form for the Daleks, and they barely even feature in it. The cliffhangers are amazing, and the plot is amazing too. Davros is played brilliantly, and the chemistry between him and the Doctor, I don't think is ever seen again between these two. On TV, that is. Oh yes, this story introduces Davros to Doctor Who, the creator of the Daleks. Of course, as it is called Genesis of the Daleks, this story goes into the origins of the Daleks, written by the real-life creator of the Daleks, Terry Nation. It really is amazing. Revenge of the Sabman is bad. Moving on. Next season, as discussed, is Harry's final season as he leaves in Terror of the Zygons. Apparently the Zygons left enough of an impact to be brought back for the 50th anniversary special, but to me I just think the Eh, I mean, they're just like shape-shifting villains. And I do think they're handled better in the revived series than the classic series. And this uh, serial is also the last to feature the Brigadier for ages. I've seen the rest of the season, and eh, it's fun Doctor Who, but it's nothing to really write home about. Pyramids of Mars has always been said to be, like, the best thing ever, but... Eh, I mean, I, I think it's good, but it's just a bit overhyped, in my opinion. The rest of the season, as I've just said, is fun. I'll likely rewatch it in the future if I happen to watch an episode or two that connects to it. Sarah leaves the Doctor in season 14, and I will say that her exit just really does hit home how long she'd been with him. I mean, she had been with him for years, and she basically she was just forced to leave due to humans not being allowed to go on Gallifrey or something. But I get it. At this point, Sarah couldn't just leave the Doctor suddenly or fall in love with someone out of the blue. I sure hope that doesn't happen in the future. I will admit, I've only ever seen The Deadly Assassin in this season. A lot of the stories have been on my list for years, but I just never get round to it. But The Deadly Assassin really is cool. And for the first time ever, the Doctor doesn't have a companion. For the entire story. As the production team wanted to test something out, but in the end, they were like, no, let's just bring a companion in. So now we're on season 15. I'll admit, I know nothing about this season. I've only seen the finale to it, but I do know it introduces K-9 to the show. The Invasion of Time isn't as good as it should be. The Insantarans are back, and this time, we see more than one at a time. And they just look off. And they're barely even in it. Or even a threat to the Doctor, who is back on Gallifrey after the events of Deadly Assassin. Leela, the Doctor's companion after Sarah, leaves him because she has fallen in love with someone out of the blue and wants to leave the Doctor now. Oh well, at least she didn't die off screen or anything. Moving on. Season 16 is the first season to have a true overarching plot to it. Unlike season 10, you can't really just go into any story willy-nilly. The season starts the key to time arc, and it is cool to see Classic Who attempt something like this. 
We meet the Doctor's new companion, Romana, who is also a Time Lord, or a Time Lady, I should say, and they both have to track down the pieces of the key to time. The cool bit is how the events of this season will affect the Doctor in, like, four seasons' time. The next season is the final of the 70s, and it's mid. Destiny of the Daleks had a lot to live up to, with Genesis being as great as it was, but instead, it just kind of, like, fell flat on its face, and just wasn't as good as it should have been, really. It also features the departure of Romana, who dies off screen and regenerates into Romana 2, played by Lala Ward? I've never been sure how to say her name, and I really hope I can get it right one day, because I quite like um, Romana 2 and the Fourth Doctor together. It's quite fun, and they had natural chemistry, as they would end up marrying, actually, the two actors. City of Death is actually the most viewed Doctor Who serial ever. I think it's really fun. Uh, though the idea of this guy having like eight different versions of himself scattered throughout time didn't really make much sense to me, but it is what it is. The rest of the season is bog standard Doctor Who. The creature of the pit is funny for this one scene alone. Hello. And so that was the 70s for Doctor Who. It makes bad in my opinion, but it's still amazing. That's the thing about Doctor Who, even when it's shit, I'll still watch it. The 70s was full of change, and barely even the same show from the start of the decade. Anyway, looking forward, shall we go into the 80s now? Season 18 is Tom Baker's final season as the Doctor, as he felt he was being forced out of the role by the new producer, John Nathan Turner. It was also Lala's ward, I really want to know how to say her name. It was also her final season as Romana 2, and also K-9's final season. It was also Matthew Ward's house first season as Adric, Sarah Sutton's first season as Nyssa, and Janet Fielding's first season as Tegan. The first serial of the season is The Leisure Hive, and eh, that's about it. Same for Meg Loss. However, after this, we go into a new arc for the show. Three loosely connected stories where the Doctor is in E-Space, a subsection of our own space. This is where the Doctor meets Adric and Romana leaves him. The thing is, for most of the season, Tom Baker just seems bored, and I think that is because he was bored, to be fair. A lot of people say he was bitter and rude for filming while this season was going on, but to be honest, I can't help but just feel sorry for this guy. He spent years on the show and now he's practically being forced out by the new producer. But at the end of the season, and the end of his final serial, The Gopolis, which is, by the way, one of my favourite serials ever, the ominous presence of the Watcher and the mystery of who he may be, and the stakes feel like they've never been higher than before as the Master returns and almost wipes out the entire universe. If it wasn't for the Doctor to save the day, even if it was at the cost of his own life, as he falls to his death and we meet the Fifth Doctor for the very first time. It's now 1982, but it feels like 1963, with a TARDIS packed to the brim with three companions and a Doctor. But this wouldn't last forever, as soon one of the companions would leave the Doctor in very fatal ways. The season was Peter Davison's first season as the Doctor. He's got a soft spot in my heart, but I have no idea why. But I won't question it. The three companions of Adric, Nyssa and Tegan... Well... It's not the worst way that three companions have ever been handled. Tegan does take the spot for my favourite Fifth Doctor companion. The first story is... Yeah, alright. It's the third in the row to feature the Master, but I'm sure we won't see him for a while. I enjoy seeing the Doctor go through his past selves while trying to find himself, and while also going through the TARDIS. I love seeing more of the TARDIS, which I think, again, should just be explored more. I love the visual metaphor of the Doctor discarding any of the Fourth Doctor's clothes to signify how the show's just changed. And to be fair, the show does feel different with this new lead. I'd say that this episode's just as important as the Second Doctor's episode, as it had been the Fourth Doctor for a very long time, and I'm sure not many people even remembered the Third Doctor regenerating. But yeah, it's a good opening for the Doctor, and 
the rest of the season suffers a bit from the full TARDIS team. Many will tell you today that four people is too big for a TARDIS, and many would point to this team as a good example of that. However, skipping forward a bit, Earthshock is a very good story in my opinion, because for the first time ever since 1975, the Cybermen are back. In an amazing twist, it is revealed that in the first part of the story, that the Cybermen are finally back, and redesigned into what is my favourite design for the Cybermen to date. The story is great, and I love the sense of doom throughout the entire story. All of this pays off when Adric dies, thinking he's going to save the Earth. The first main companion death ever. The Doctor did have companions who died, but they'd only been on the show for, like, five episodes when they died, so it doesn't really impact you as much as it should. Adric's death leads straight into the next story, Time Flight, and I'm just about to finish the first part, and the Master is yet to... He's back. Never mind. Time Flight is a mess. I've seen it a few times now, and I can't really remember what happens to them, really. I mean, I know they go back in time in a plane or something, and the Master shows up, and then he leaves again, and then the Doctor goes back to the TARDIS and leaves Tegan behind for some reason. I don't know why. Season 20 is the anniversary season of the show, 1983. And we're so ready to celebrate. Every story this year features the return of a monster from the past 20 years. Some from many years ago, some from the season prior. This was recently released on Blu-ray. And I have never finished it. Why? I don't know, I'm busy. I hear it's good, and I hear the episodes I have watched are good. I have watched the first, third, and final story of the season. I've enjoyed them all, so maybe I should get round to it. Of course, the series ends with the master... Coming back again. The Doctor reunited with Tegan and met a new companion, Turlo, and Nissa departs from the TARDIS. All in four stories' time. After the 20th, 20th season finish, we got the 20th anniversary special. The Five Doctors. And I've seen it a few times now, and it is a fun adventure, and it's always nice to see more than one Doctor at a time. It's just a shame Tom Baker didn't want to return, but I suppose he was still trying to distance himself from the show. I haven't seen much from the start of season 21, but I have seen the final four stories. Revelation of the Daleks. It's dark, and in a way it reminds me of Earthshock. It's nice to see the Daleks again for the first time in the 80s, but I feel the story just fails to deliver for me personally. However, it is notable for the exit of Tegan after three years with the Doctor. Planet of Fire is your average Doctor Who episode. Not as good as Revelation of the Daleks, but still, if I'm in the mood, I might put it on. It introduces the Doctor's newest companion, Perry, and it also the departure of Turlo, as he leaves the Doctor to be on his own planet again. The Caves of Androzani is just great. The setting is great, the atmosphere is great, and the music is amazing. The Doctor really shines in this and is really heroic, and I see a lot of the modern Doctor shining in from now on. Though I can see the modern Doctor in every Doctor, I feel like this is where the change from classic Who to modern Who begun. The ending of the episode, The Fifth Doctor's Regeneration, it's amazing, and it is my all-time favourite. Truly one of the greatest stories in the history of Doctor Who. And that is the end of The Fifth Doctor's Era. He isn't to everyone's taste, but I enjoy him. He's not my all-time favourite Doctor, but he's not low down either. As I've said before, I can see a lot of the modern incarnations in The Fifth Doctor, mainly in his final story. Now, one week after The Caves of Androzani finished, one final serial starring The Sixth Doctor stirred. I don't like it, and neither do a lot of people. I find it boring and just bad, really. I'd say this is the first bad Doctor Who story, and a lot of fans would say the start of the downfall. However, despite ending on a bad note, I do love The Sixth Doctor. In my opinion, his TV tenure is not the best it could have been. But in the audios, he's just shining. And I just wish he'd been given more of a first shot at his time on TV. Because you can tell Colin Baker loves the role. And for that reason, I love him too. That said, I haven't seen this first season. I've seen the first serial and I'd like to watch a few more. But the issue is, the episodes are 45 minutes long. Like like the revival. But the thing is, I don't think Classic Who should be 45 minutes wrong. It just doesn't work. I think that was realised in the next season, The Trial of the Time Lord. Yes, this serial is the entire season. It consists of 14 parts that features the Doctor on trial. I'm not going to talk about it that much as I haven't seen it in a while and it's far too long to watch again. 
But I will say, the scene where the Doctor denounces the Time Lord is one of the best moments in the entire show for me. I really do think Colin should have stayed on for at least one more year. Perry leaves the Doctor and Mel joins the Doctor in the season, and the two go off into the TARDIS for the next adventure. However, by the next story, Colin had been sacked and the role had been given to Sylvester McCoy. That's a shame, because Colin loved the role, and everything that came with it. I think if I could just go back in time and convince the Doctor to keep Colin in for just a tiny bit longer, with a new production team maybe, but it was never meant to be. And I'd say the sixth Doctor is one of the most robbed Doctors ever. The seventh Doctor is a favourite of mine, and I think his season is the weakest, but I don't think that's bad. I think the first story is eh, but going forward, the rest's one. Paradise Towers is another eh, but it does reflect the new era very well. Delta and the Bannerman is something I'd ignored for ages, and then I watched it a few weeks ago, and my god, it's fun. It doesn't take itself too seriously, and the characters, like, just believe everything that's happening around them. It's a fun viewing, and it shouldn't be skipped at all. Dragonfire is the final story for Mel, and the first for Ace, my favourite second Doctor companion. The story is forgettable, but still a good fun, and it is worth a few watches. The cliffhanger to the first episode is iconic and just plain silly, but there was a reason why the Doctor did that, and it was in the script, but it was just never shown because the production team couldn't be bothered doing it. The next season begins to turn to the darker side of the Doctor, starting with Remembrance of the Daleks, my favourite Doctor Who story ever. It's fun, the music are great, the Daleks are at their best, with two factions of Daleks fighting against each other. And for the final time in the classic series, the Daleks are here. The setting of 1963 is a good pick, and I love the callbacks to the other eras of the show. The way the Doctor mocks Stavros is amazing, and the way he tricks Stavros into destroying Scarrow shows his new manipulative side that would only be expanded on in the future. The next serial, The Happiness Patrol, slept on, I think. It's amazing and fun, and the reflections of the current politics at the time are still clear to this day. And I think the story really deserves a watch, as even just the concept of it alone is cool. Silver Nemesis, this is the 25th anniversary special of the show, and to be honest, it lets the show down. It's not as good, in my opinion, as other anniversary specials, and it just kind of bores me. The story also sets up the Cartmel Master Plan, and it would be expanded on for years to come. So that's something, I suppose. I've never seen the greatest show in the galaxy, funnily <laughs> enough. However, I have seen Doctor Who, and I've seen the greatest show in the galaxy. So, that's it. The next season, season 26, really shows the Doctor going into a darkest place. He manipulates everything and everyone to his advantage. This would have paid off in the next season, but we'll get to that. The stories are good. I've not seen many of them in a while, so I'll just skip talking about them. But a out for me is the final season in survival, where the Ace and Doctor walk away, ready to face their next adventures in the next season of Doctor Who. Oh boy, I can't wait! Yeah, the show got cancelled. That's the problem. The show got cancelled just before it was about to get really good. It's never going to come back, is it? Oh well. We now enter the 90s. Known as the Wilderness Years. There's nothing here. There's a few specials, like Dimensions in Time, which feels like it was taken right out of the 80s, and I'm not talking about it. However, remember, it's canon, and it always will be. The Curse of Fatal Death is a funny spoof on Doctor Who, and I do think Rowan Atkinson could be the Doctor in the future, and I wouldn't complain. The other way people got into Doctor Who content was through books, and I've only read one book from the 90s, and I did enjoy it, but I just struggled to decide if the books are canon or not. And I like to imagine they are, but I have a hard time fitting them into the canon. However, we did get one episode of Doctor Who in the 90s. And it features the Eighth Doctor. And I love the Eighth Doctor. He's my favourite Doctor, and that's funny because this is his only full episode on TV. That's not good. I hate to say it. I really do. Because I love seeing it, and I love seeing him doing Doctory things, but this movie just isn't good from a story's perspective. However, I will never turn down the chance to watch it, and I love it to bits. 
The Eighth Doctor would appear in books and a lot of audios, but if I were to talk about them, I'd be here for the rest of my life. So let's just get to the 2000s already. Welcome to the new millennium, 2000. Nope, no Doctor Who yet. 2001? Mm, we've got some Ape Doctor audios. 2002? We've got some animations. 2003, the 40th year. Surely we get something. And we did! Scream of the Shalker. It's not canon to me. But I've seen it, and for what I think it is, it's great. I think the Shalker Doctor deserved more, and I really do think it's cool that Richard E. Grant played the Doctor twice. Oh, and by the way, the show's coming back in 2005, so let's just skip to 2005 and meet the next Doctor. Finally, in two, people in 2005 shouted, Doctor Who is back, and it's better than ever before. Christopher Eccleston is the new Doctor. Billy Piper is the first companion of the Revival series. So let's just speed through the ninth Doctor's era. Rose is a great start to the new era of the show. I love the mystery of the Doctor, and I love how modern-day elements are used in the plot. This is no longer the same show as it was 20 years ago. The End of the World is not as good as Road, but it's still decent for fun. The mystery of the Doctor is still there, and we begin to set the Time War up. The Unquiet Dead is not bad, it's not good. The first flop of the series, but it still deserves a watch. Aliens of London and World War Three is just funny, and it is a good first two-parter. Dalek is about a Dalek, and it is one of the best Dalek stories ever. Oh, and the Doctor says, kill yourself. The long game sucks. Father's Day is really good, and I love that it gives us more of a backstory for Rose and her family. The Empty Child and the Doctor dances is good too. But, like, yeah. I enjoy it, but it's not as much as other people would enjoy it. It introduces Captain Jack, and I've always liked his character for ages. Boomtown is underrated, and it is actually good. I just feel a lot of people are only realising that now. Bad Wolf and the Parting of the Ways is a really good final story for the Doctor. Seeing him face the idea of destroying the Daleks one more time, but this time not actually doing it, shows how much he's changed over the series. And his sacrifice just to save Rose is really sweet. And that was the Ninth Doctor. Sadly, Christopher didn't want to stay in the role due to behind-the-scenes disagreements. And that's a shame, because he really suits the Doctor, especially in this new era. And I don't think we'd even have Doctor Who today without him. Series 1 always felt magical to me, and it will always have a special place in my heart. Anyway, moving on to the Tenth Doctor. Everyone knows this guy, David Tennant. He is the love of my Doctor Who life. The Tenth Doctor is amazing, and my favourite Doctor, said seven-year-old me. But no, I still love the guy. The first episode, and also the second ever Christmas special, and he's only in it for half of it. He's, you know, I mean, he's in later... And he's ready to save the day, and he even loses a hand in the process. The Christmas invasion is fun. Despite being the first episode of a Doctor, it doesn't take itself too seriously, and just as fun. However, it does still treat the threat as an actual threat, and that is a good introduction for the new Doctor. Series 2, however, in my opinion, is not such a good start. The series is just kind of meh. It has, like, Great episodes, like the Cyberman 2 part in the finale. But some other episodes are just episodes in the finales. Though a standout for me is the school reunion episode. While the plot and the villain aren't really good, the inclusion of Sarah Jane Smith is great. And I'm glad she got to return to the show, and even got her own show later on. That, regrettably, I've only seen a few episodes of. But overall, the series is still good. Just not as good as the first series. But, oh well. Rose is separated from the Doctor at the end of the series, and it's quite emotional. It always gets me really sad, especially when the Doctor cries. Seeing the Doctor cry is such a weird thing. Like, he barely does it, so when he does do it, you know it's serious. It shows a very vulnerable side to the character that we don't usually get to see in the show. After the Doctor cries, we're left on a cliffhanger when a woman who is only credited as the Bride is transported into the TARDIS to be continued at Christmas. At Christmas, we find out the bride's name is Donna Noble. This is a very important episode for the Tempo Doctor, and also the 14th Doctor, but more on him later. The episode is just like the Christmas special. It doesn't take itself too seriously, but it's not too silly either. 
in my opinion, all Christmas specials should be like that. Series 3 introduces Martha, then has a leave at the end of the series. I do like the style of companion if they're actually used well. And for most of the time, they are. However, with Martha, she does leave the Doctor quite quick. But then she is creature quite a lot in Season 4, so that's great. I did used to dislike Martha, but as time's gone on, I've changed my mind about her quite a lot. She ranks second of my favourite Temporary Doctor companions list, whereas she probably would have been ranked last a few years ago. That is mainly because I don't like Series 3 all that much. And to be fair, it has some questionable episodes, but I like it. Not as much as Season 1 or Series 2, but I've recently rewatched Smith & Jones, and I'm glad I did because it's caused me to want to watch more of Series 3. It's a fun series, and I love the final six episodes of the series. They're all just prime Doctor Who. And it just makes me so angry that I've disliked the series for so long when these episodes are so great. The final three are amazing, with their master's return to the show since 1989, played by Sir Derek Jacobi and John Sim, two amazing actors who both play the master well. I mean, the resolution to the plot of the final episode's a bit silly, but it's followed by a very emotional scene of the master's death, and then Martha's exit before the fucking Titanic crashes into the TARDIS. What the actual fuck? Oh yeah, right, see you at Christmas. Voyage of the Damned is something I've watched a few times, but I don't really like. The co-star is Kylie Minogue, but honestly, I don't really care for her character. I feel like I can't really get too attached to her since I know she's going to die in like half an hour. But the episode's still fun. Not silly, but still. It's good. And then that was Series 3. As I said, I enjoy it, so let's just hope Series 4 is just as good. Yeah, it is. And I already knew that. The best of the 2000s and the final full series of the 2000s. The Doctor is reunited with Donna, and Donna is my favourite Temper Doctor companion by a mile. And I also suppose my favourite 14th Doctor companion. The series is full of solid episodes, and the worst it's gonna get is just mediocre. I could watch any episode of this series and be happy. Besides one, The Unicorn and the Wasp is one I will never watch again. Because, and only because, I have a phobia of wasps. So I don't really have an opinion on that episode, because the only time I ever watched it was like ten years ago. But after that, everything else is amazing. The Library 2 part features a woman called Ribbersong, who also dies at the end. So I'm sure she won't be important later on. Midnight is one I'm not too sure on. I've seen it a few times, and I've never really understood the praise it gets. Trust me, I've tried to, but I just... I think it's good, but I just don't think it's as good as people say it is. The final three episodes are all amazing. They all feel intense. The return of Rose, just as the Doctor gets shot by a Dalek, is shocking. And the regeneration cliffhanger is really cool. I just wish I'd seen it live. Death Ross's return's inevitable, but I didn't really think that Modern Who really uses him right. The Daleks feel like the biggest they've ever been, ever. And that's why Stolen Earth and Journey's End... The final series finale of the Russell T. Davis era. And my favourite. The series is followed by a few specials. The first two are nothing special, pun intended. But the final two are good. The Waters of Mars feels like a Halloween special, despite being released in November. (laughs) The Flood is very scary. And the episode is just sad, with so many deaths in it. It's worth at least three watches. The End of Time made me try and... Think... How would I make a Doctor Who episode? You know? And I wanted to when I first watched it, after I cried because the Tenth Doctor regenerates in this. It's not as good as it could have been, but it's still worth a good watch. You know? Like, sit down at like Christmas or New Year's and just put on the end of time. Usually I say Christmas specials should be fun and not too serious, but not this one. As it's a regeneration episode, it needs to be serious. And RTD knew this, as the second episode is an amazing send-off to the Temple Doctor. The long farewell tour is really cool of an idea, like, but I wish they'd just try more. Which they do. In fact, every Doctor from this point gets a farewell tour. now we're in the 11th Doctor's era. 
A new production team has taken over. Stephen Moffat is the new showrunner. And Series 5 is amazing. One of my favourite episodes of The Revival is The Eleventh Hour. I think the fact that it many stopped watching Doctor Who after the Tenth Doctor is a shame. Because The Eleventh Doctor, while he has his flaws, isn't bad at all. The thing is, The Eleventh Doctor plays on the darker side of the Doctor while hiding that really well. The error just grows off of the RTD error instead of just ignoring it. Series 5 is great, but has some meh episodes too. That's alright though, since when it's good, it's good. The finale is a bit messy, but it has some great scenes and it's nothing to be ignored. Series 6 is not as good, sadly. The storyline's a bit messy and I feel it just drags on for a bit, but it's not bad either. A personal standout for the season is the God Complex, and it is exactly what I want from a Doctor Who episode. And I just wish it would just be more like that in the future. Sadly, the season is the first finale to the show that I don't actually like. And that's a shame, because I do think the series is good. But to be honest, the finale just kind of exists. Like, I've seen it a few times, but I couldn't tell you what actually happens in it. Series 7 is the weakest Matt Smith series, in my opinion. The first bit is solid, featuring Amy and Rory, but then they leave. In the Angels Take Manhattan. The Doctor meets Clara, and the two have this weird sort of relationship, but the series goes on, and the final season reveals the existence of a new Doctor. The War Doctor, played by the late, great John Hurt. That's the first series I ever watched. It's not bad. It's just not as strong as anything before it, really. The specials that follow it are really good, though. The Night of the Doctor sees the Eighth Doctor's regeneration into the War Doctor. I love that episode to bits. The Day of the Doctor features the return of David Tennant as the Doctor for the 50th anniversary special. I'm sure after this, though, we'll never see David Tennant again. The episode is great, and I remember watching it when it came out, and this was the first ever special episode of Doctor Who I'd ever seen. And it will forever hold a special place in my heart. The Time of the Doctor is good, too. I love the plot of the Doctor protecting a planet for the rest of his life, and I love his speech just as he regenerates into the 12th Doctor, played by Peter Capaldi. Yes, that's right, we're now on the 12th Doctor's era. Some people say this is where the show started to decline again, but I don't think that's true. In fact, I think that's wrong. This era is great, the writing is great, and though out of the three series, only a handful of them are bad. In fact, in my opinion, the Ape series only has one bad episode. It's just perfect. The Doctor is perfect, Clara is perfect, and the Ark is perfect. Standout episodes are Deep Breath, Listen, Flatline, The Mummy on the Orient Express, and the two final episodes. The series introduces Missy, who is the master, but as a woman now? Oh my god, no way, Jose! However, this series starts the trend of the master slash Missy working with the Cybermen. I don't like that idea. It just kind of bores me after I've seen it, like, four times, you know? And I really hope that in the future, the Cybermen are just allowed to exist on their own instead of working for the master... Because since this appearance, the Cybermen haven't been the villain of their own story ever, I don't think. Series 9 starts alright. It's not the best opening. That's fair though, but I like that they brought Missy back more as an ally than an antagonist straight away. This works in favour of Missy's character arc too. The majority of the season is really good, and it only has one episode that I don't like. But I think if it was just done a bit differently, Sleep No More could have been better than it was. The final two are the best episodes of the season. Heaven Sent and Hellbent are both good episodes, and I'm tired of people saying only one is good. Yes, the first story is better than the last, but they're both good, and I love the shots of the Doctor on Gallifrey and Hellbent. Oh yes, that's right, the Doctor is back on Gallifrey after all of this time in the revival. This is episodes also the departure of Clara, who is wiped from the Doctor's head, and so she travels for her own TARDIS with someone else. Series 10 is the height of the Capaldi and the Moffat era of Doctor Who. And it's also the end. Again, like the past two series, there's only like one bad episode, and that is only because I don't like it. There's nothing I can say about that episode other than I just don't like it. We introduced Bill to the show. I love Bill. She's great. She's only in it for one. But she's handled right. We also meet Nardole, who was introduced in the last Christmas special before this series. The series is great, and that's why it's a shame that Capaldi's era isn't well-liked, because it really is a great part of the show. The final Twelfth Doctor episode is special to me, as I went on a podcast a few years back to talk about it. 
My favourite scene is the first Doctor's first scene. I think it's beautiful and it really got me hyped for the next era of the show. However, sadly, I do not like the 13th Doctor's era. It really does upset me that I have to say that, but I don't like the era. I think it could have been great. It could have been the best era. But eh, it wasn't written very well. And I'm not going to be talking about the era too long because I don't have many nice things to say about it and I don't want to be negative on the show I love. But what I'll say is, I love Jodie Whittaker, I love Chris Chibnall. I don't enjoy his era, I don't like his writing, but I love the man. I did watch all of his era as it came out and I will forever respect the guy for keeping the show on air during COVID-19. I think he's a great guy and I really do wish him well and I just wish I could have enjoyed his era. But it makes me happy to see that other people enjoyed his error. So I'm glad that the error is still here. So, in my heart, the error's good. Oh, and by the way, the man brought the Eighth Doctor back. So, he's the best person ever. And while there are parts I liked in the Thirteenth Doctor's era, like Flux, I do remember watching that live too. I enjoyed it, I watched it again, I wasn't too keen on it. The Thirteenth Doctor's regeneration is beautiful. Probably one of the best in the show. I remember, despite everything about this era, I almost teared up a bit as she was regenerating. And that's when the reveal of the 14th Doctor made me jump up in excitement. And then I realised I had to wait 13 months for the next era. And I never thought I'd be on the other side, but here we are. November 2023. And I am not long away from the 14th Doctor's first episode. The Star Beast. I hope everyone enjoys it, and I can't wait to see what comes next. With the 15th Doctor upon us, and the future of Russell T. Davis' new era on the show. So, here is to the future of Doctor Who, and to 60 more years in time and space. The greatest show in the galaxy. So, That was the last 60 years of Doctor Who. And the way I'm going to answer my question of how is Doctor Who the greatest show in the galaxy? Well, anyone can enjoy it. Anyone can find something that they like from the show. Anyone can just live in the show. One of those didn't make sense. But what I'm saying is, Doctor Who just is the greatest show. It's magic, it's fun, it's dark, it's it's everything a show should be. And it's Doctor Who. And that's why it's the greatest show in the galaxy.